Now, in order for us to get there, we've got to know how, or we've got to start somewhere. And the first place that we start is with setting up the equations of motion for a multi-degree of freedom system. And more importantly, we also want to take a complex structure and idealize it so that we only extract the information that is most important to us without wasting our time. And thank you, Isaac Newton, for helping us develop equations of motion. And the first thing that we normally have to do is understand how to idealize a structural system. I'm going to look at a building frame, and here is the best I can draw a 2D building frame in all its glory. And this building frame has distributed masses everywhere. Each joint of this frame, uh, because it's everything is flexible, each joint of this frame can move in three directions in 2D. Six directions if it was 3D, but we're gonna we're gonna keep this a little bit simpler. Alright, I've already idealized this somewhat, right? But here there'd be like one, two, three degrees of freedom and in fact we would end up with 12 degrees of freedom here which if we wanted to set up the equations of motion we would end up with a 12 by 12 stiffness matrix 12 by 12 mass matrix 12 by 12 damping matrix and it would just get so cumbersome that it would and it really has a lot of information that we don't need because when an earthquake comes and if it's only going left to right in the ground these vertical accelerations you know we're going to neglect those we're going to neglect the rotations we're going to assume that the beams are rigid and instead of having distributed masses, we're going to take all the mass on one floor and just lump it into one right in the middle. Uh, we're going to take all the damping effects that are happening in the structure from friction and etc. right here. We're going to put that within one floor and we're going to change this thing into this. And what we've done by saying that we have rigid beams, what we're saying is that the rotations here at the joints are negligible. We're going to neglect the vertical deflections or axial deformations in these columns. And so all we're going to be left with are this motion and this motion. And in fact, we're going to end up with two degrees of freedom. So this will end up being a two degree of freedom structure. And we're going to say that each floor, the total stiffness of all columns in this direction represents K here. We'll take this K2 and then K1. There will be damp on the first floor here first story we'll call this C1 and C2 so the position of the first floor will be described by movement from here as x1 as a function of time or the position of one as a function of time or position of floor one as a function of time and position of floor two as a function of time and here the masses on each floor we will describe as m1 and m2 and just in summary, here are the assumptions that I've made. And if I wanted to even simplify this a little bit more, I could take this two-story frame and just make it into a, a really fancy schmancy lollipop, right? I could go boom, lump the mass of floor one, and lump the mass of floor two. And I could say that each floor here this first floor K1, and I'll assume some sort of Rayleigh damping so that the damping is just a function of the stiffness and mass of the structure. I'll just call that C1, and here K2 and C2 like this. And then let's even say that there's a force applied at each level of the structure, some externally applied force that causes the vibration or a forcing function, P of T on the first floor, a forcing function, P two of t on the top floor and there are ways to take the ground motion and translate it to the as equivalent forces on your structure you know this is my idealized two-story system a two-story building looks like a lollipop stacked on top of each other and it has two degrees of freedom what we want to do now is determine the equations of motion for